My name is Matthew Hyman, registered dietitian and type 1 diabetic. Today, we're going to talk about carbohydrates and diabetes. Before we begin, I'd like to first introduce the many sources of carbohydrates. For most people, when they hear the word carb, they think of breads and pasta. But did you know that we also get our carbs from fruits, vegetables, and some dairy products? So what are carbs and why do we need them? Well, in biochemical terms, a carbohydrate is a biomolecule which consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. When digested and absorbed, our body's blood sugar increases. Insulin, a hormone produced by the pancreas, is then secreted and starts acting like a key by unlocking the doors to our cells, allowing for this blood sugar to enter the cell, ultimately providing energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. But what is unique about the carbohydrate is that our oxygen-carrying red blood cells and our brain cells prefer energy from carbs exclusively. This makes them our body's primary energy source. Think about our bodies like a car. We need engine oil and a radiator coolant to keep the car moving, but it is the gasoline that actually fuels the car. While our bodies need energy and other components from fats and proteins, just like a car needs engine oil and a coolant, but carbohydrates are like our body's gasoline, keeping our brains going and our bodies moving. Now, what about carbohydrates and diabetes? Well, just like we talked about earlier, as carbs are digested and absorbed, the sugar in our blood increases. And in order for our red blood cells and brain cells to use this sugar as energy, well, the sugar needs to make it into the cell. Well, the problem is these cells are locked. The doors to these cells are locked and the key well, the key is insulin. Insulin is a hormone produced by the beta cells in the pancreas. And this hormone has more than one function, but the primary function is to serve as a key which allows the sugar to enter the cell. It unlocks the door so the sugar can get into the cell, right? And then the sugar can be metabolized and used as energy. The issue in diabetes is that this key is either not produced at all not enough of this key is produced or the key has become dull and worn out and no longer effective. So think of an insulin deficiency versus an insulin insensitivity. That's where the different types of diabetes comes into play. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition in which the immune system attacks and kills the pancreatic beta cells. The immune attack on the beta cells results in an insulin deficiency because insulin is no longer produced. And remember, without insulin, the doors to the cells stay locked and sugar is unable to enter. Well, if sugar can't enter, sugar can't be metabolized, our brain cells, our red blood cells can't use the sugar as energy, and that results into a backup of sugar in our bloodstream. And that's what's known as hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. There's no cure for type 1 diabetes, and the patient will have to infuse, inject, or inhale insulin for the rest of their life in order to manage their diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, either not enough insulin is produced or the insulin produced is no longer effective as the individual has developed an insulin resistance. So just like in type 1 diabetes, if blood sugar can't enter the cell due to this insulin production, then high blood sugar is the result. Now, treatment for type 2 diabetes varies between oral medications, injectable insulin, and management through diet and exercise alone, depending on the severity of the diabetes. In many cases, type 2 diabetes can be reversed, but it is possible that through chronic high blood sugar and persistent damage to insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas, that the diabetes reaches a point where reversal is no longer possible. There also exists a diabetes during pregnancy known as gestational diabetes. And while many times this diabetes resolves, once the baby is born, it is possible that the diabetes carries on into the new mother's postpartum life, and the treatment may be similar to the treatment for type 2 diabetes. At the end of the day, poor control of type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes leads to hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar. And this high blood sugar, over time, leads to a long list of complications, including damage to our nerves, neuropathy, leading to amputations, damage to our eyes, retinopathy, leading to blindness, or damage to our kidneys, nephropathy, leading to renal failure.
This is why it is so important for a diabetic to understand the sources of a carbohydrate and how to accurately count the carb content of their meal or snack. When a diabetic is on insulin therapy, either through multiple daily injections or an insulin pump, they are usually given an insulin to carb ratio. This means that for a certain amount of carbohydrate that they eat, they're gonna need a certain amount of insulin to inject. Let's use a simple ratio like one to 10. If a diabetic is prescribed an insulin to carb ratio of one to 10, this means that for every 10 grams of carbohydrate, one unit of insulin must be delivered into the body. So if my lunch consisted of 60 grams of carbs, then I would need six units of insulin in order for that sugar that will be absorbed from that carb to enter my cells and be used as energy. And this is because 60 grams divided by 10, which is my, my insulin to carb ratio, one to 10, 60 divided by 10 is six. So I would need six units to cover the 60 grams of carb. One unpleasant side effect of insulin therapy and diabetes is the opposite of hyperglycemia, known as hypoglycemia, also known as low blood sugar. Maybe you've heard that a diabetic needs to always have access to candy or some type of quick sugar. And the reason for this is to treat a low blood sugar. There are many things that could drop somebody's blood sugar, things like physical activity, incorrectly determining carbohydrate content of a meal or snack, and incorrectly dosing insulin. Now, when something like that happens, sugar in the bloodstream begins to fall below what is considered ideal for the body. An ideal blood sugar is about 90 milligrams per deciliter to about 115 milligrams per deciliter. Symptoms of a low blood sugar include confusion, sweating, irritability, dizziness, and shakiness, just to name a few. And the usual treatment for a low blood sugar is 15 grams of carbohydrate and then rechecking blood sugar in about 10 minutes to assess whether or not the blood sugar is actually climbing right back up. Now, a lot of these small candies that we get for Halloween time um, in the stores, these are about 15 grams of carb. Um, so this is a good kind of way to go as far as treating a low blood sugar with, with, with candies is these, these, uh, these snack size, mini size candies. Now to provide you with a more personal insight into diabetes and what it is like to live with it every day. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I live with type 1 diabetes and I have been since I was 16. I was diagnosed in May of 2012 and it was this diagnosis that was actually my motivation to becoming a registered dietitian and ultimately a certified diabetes educator now known as a diabetes care and education specialist. My dad's brother my older brother, who is a registered nurse, and his daughter are also type 1 diabetics. So there is definitely a genetic component that goes along with this condition. Sometimes I'm on insulin pump therapy, or I'll inject Traceba once a day when I'm on a break from my pump, like I am now. Uh, the Traceba keeps my blood sugar down all day in between my meals and while I sleep. The insulin pump does the same thing, but instead is injecting uh, a different kind of insulin every hour. There's a certain rate that it injects each hour. Um, so this is what I'm normally wearing, but sometimes the scar tissue can build up when you're wearing one of these things for too long. Um, and I've been diagnosed for the last eight years. So most of the eight years I've been on an insulin pump. So I recently just took a break and I'm on, um, I'm injecting once a day with Traceba, um, which has given me they both have their own pros and cons, but this, there are different types of treatment for type 1 diabetes. I also use a different kind of insulin therapy that not too many people are aware of, and it's called the Freza insulin, which is actually inhalable. So this is the inhaler. The insulin is a little powder that sits in this little caps, capsule. I stick it in here and, um, and I inhale. Um, and this, this is quick acting insulin, so it covers my meals and my snacks. So like I said earlier, I'll inject the Traceba once a day in the mornings. Um, that keeps my blood sugar down in between my meals, but this is actually what covers my carbohydrate when I eat at a meal or a snack. As I'm sure you can imagine, after everything we've talked about today, there is a lot to think about when managing a condition like diabetes. In fact, research shows that a diabetic person makes at least 180 extra decisions per day than somebody without diabetes. 
So my hope as a diabetic and a dietitian is to teach people that diabetes does not have to be a limiting factor in living an entirely full life, just like those without diabetes. I can still have that slice of cake or the slice of pizza during those special occasions. All I have to do is tell my insulin pump what my current blood sugar is and how many grams of carbs are in those slices and the insulin is delivered. I've enjoyed hiking to many peaks over the last few years and never once have I felt like my body was limited in what it could do. I just need to take a little bit more care to plan. So for those in this class who are studying to enter the medical field in any capacity, keep all of this in mind because undoubtedly you will come across a diabetic patient and an informed, empathetic provider can make the most difference. If you ever have any questions about diabetes and nutrition, feel free to reach out to me via email and visit my website for more information.